Welcome back to Conversations with Zendesk, where we explore how new trends and technology in customer experience are shaping the way that we connect with customers. Each week, we speak to customer experience innovators and experts to hear their thoughts and ideas on the future of CX. I'm your host, Nicole Saunders. In this episode, I'm speaking with Ian Hunt, Director of Customer Services and Procurement for Liberty London, one of London's oldest luxury retailers. Ian and his team look after all aspects of customer care for both Liberty's physical and digital businesses, with teams based both in their iconic London store and via a third-party BPO based in Cape Town, South Africa. Ian and I discuss the technological changes that physical retailers have had to implement over the past several years, how he's thinking about the future, and what other retailers should be thinking about in their digital evolution. Enjoy! Ian Hunt, welcome to your Conversations with Zendesk. How are you today? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks for inviting me. So tell us a little bit about Liberty London. What is it that your organization does? Liberty London is a department store in the West End of London. It's been operating for, we're coming up to our 150th anniversary in the next few years. A one shop, it's a, what they call a grade two star listed building. Quite iconic. Any of your listeners who may have seen the film Cruella will, will be familiar because it featured in the story and it was filmed by Disney at our shop. And this is the barber store. We sell all things from fashion and so beauty products that are famous for carpets and rugs, from stationery, flowers. All sorts. And tell us a little bit about your role. What do you do there and what is your day-to-day like? So I am celebrating nine years at Liberty this very week. My full job title is Director of Customer Services and Procurement, which is um, 35-ish people in customer service and one person who looks after procurement. So predominantly uh, the obvious stuff, uh, look after customers that come into the store, uh, customers that contact us via the telephone, via email. We also operate a a third-party call center down in uh, Cape Town in South Africa to look after our online customers. And then the procurement stuff is just as important, um, but not as front of house. So all, all the, the famous carry bags, uh, ribbons, boxes, all, all, the, all the lovely things that customers like to get from us other than the product that we sell. And Liberty London has been around for a long time, I understand. Yeah, our first shop was opened in 1875. The building we're in now, uh, we've moved to in um, 1924. So next year will be the centenary. It's, a, it's what they call a, a listed building. So you, you, uh, what you're allowed to do to it in terms of the structure of the building is very closely monitored by um, essentially by the government. So I imagine in all of that time, the business has gone through many rounds of evolving how it operates and what it does. But I think most particularly familiar to our audience is the way that a lot of things have changed for retail businesses over the last few years. COVID forced a lot of businesses to have to shift to online, creating digital experience and things like that. Tell us a little bit about what have been some of the big going from physical to digital evolutions for Liberty. When I first joined the the web the website was a very small part of our business, you know, less than maybe seven, eight percent. And with the advent of the lockdowns and COVID, it very quickly went to a hundred percent for a period of time because the store was closed. Our settles are around 50-50. You know, we have some very, very loyal customers. We're very lucky in that respect. The brand is well loved and a lot of tourists. So when we went into lockdown, we still had people from all around the world who still wanted their liberty fix. So we had to adapt really quickly. History has told us we did it relatively successfully. It maybe didn't feel like that way the first two or three months. As you went through some of that transformation, what were some of the most important things that you found made a really big impact on your customers' experience? What kinds of things uh, really stand out to you if you think back to that period of time? Everybody throughout the world was going through a period of change, weren't they? Um, And getting used to the the phrase was the new normal. Everyone was using that phrase, weren't they, for the first year. We were reactive uh, at the same time in almost reinventing the wheel, what felt like on a weekly basis. Traditionally, Liberty is, as I said, it's one shop. So the, the, the idea of maintaining a very accurate inventory file hasn't always been uh, front of mind at Liberty because most of our customers will walk in, see what goods you have on the, on the display. Whereas to, to operate a, an e-commerce business, that's absolutely paramount. If the, the system says you've got five or something, you need to have five, not, not one, not 50. So being able to maintain that was quite a challenge because we weren't set up for it. Trying to put the controls in place for that type of thing at a time when everybody wants to sell, sell, sell and, and keep the company afloat was, um, yeah, so not all that is challenges. 
I imagine so. We sort of went through this phase of going everything on digital. And like you said, reinventing the wheel every week to try to keep up with how do you keep the business going when there yep. is no physical space. And now a few years later, we're kind of coming back to this place where people are coming back out into the world. Things are back to the old normal, I guess we could say a little bit more. How does that balance look for you? Are you still finding, are you finding most people are coming back to the physical space? Has this sort of forever changed your digital business? I think it's forever changed the digital business, but in a very positive way. There are very few businesses in the retail space that start as a website and then become a physical shop. And I've often theorized um, with colleagues and friends that if they did, you'd probably do things slightly differently. Uh, and this is kind of a unique opportunity because we effectively, in a very short period of time, we've done that. We've gone from an online early business to a business with a physical presence. So many of the things that we changed, that we had to change, you know, the way we did things, have remained. So, you know, the, 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 the way we, um, we move product around. The, you know, the, the way we, we, we work with our internal colleagues to keep contact. Teams, Zoom, for example, you know, it wasn't really a thing. I'm sure Zoom existed. I remember having Zoom calls and people could that's long before COVID. But I would never dream of having a Zoom or a Teams call with somebody who was in the next office or in the next county or in the next state in the US, which we now do as a matter of course. You know, the whole working from home thing was never particularly prevalent here in London for sort of retailers, but it, it's a thing now and it, you know, and it, it's really made a difference to, to our colleagues. And if it makes it into our colleagues, it makes it into our customers as well. What kind of a difference have you seen that it's made for your colleagues? It would appear that staff attention seems to be a good thing because yeah. we no longer, I mean, our, our office is in is next to the shop. It's in right in the heart of London. So, you know, it's uh, we're very lucky in London. The, the public transport is very good. However, it's not particularly cheap. So, you know, so if somebody chooses not to travel in every day, that can make a significant difference to their to their life. Um, you know, the, the, their work life balance is is far improved. So, if for certain roles, the, the requirement to be in the office every day is no longer there. In many ways, the requirement to be in London every day is no longer there. We can support people in the right way. I would never have dreamt of having a call center in South Africa prior to this, right. which is quite quite literally is the other side of the world. But they speak the same neighbors, they're pretty much in the same uh, time zone as us, and it, and it works really, really well. So It's crazy how things have changed so unexpectedly over the last few years. How do you think that customer expectations have changed? What are your customers at large telling you that's different than it was maybe five, six, ten years ago? In many ways, it's, it hasn't changed for Liberty because the, the customers that we experience when the web was very small, their expectation was they were buying from a brand. So they, they would expect the same level of luxury, personalized service that you get if you were, if you come to our store. So then when we moved to selling online, the expectation was there. And initially we weren't able to deliver that because it was so very small and, and, and you know, we, we didn't have the infrastructure to do that. When sales went crazy, we had to because we had no choice and the lessons that we've learned are hopefully the ones that are going to stick around for years to come so the, that we deliver the same luxury service that you get so when you come into liberty it's um for anyone who's been it's very quirky we're quite different that the staff are the same you know and, and, we, and we absolutely pride ourselves in that trying to extend that into a digital world is a, is a little bit more difficult because you don't have the interaction you can't tell from like a face-to-face -face conversation like we're having am i am i talking to somebody who's smiling back at me or am i talking to somebody who's not interested in what i've got to say it's, you, know, you don't know that whereas in the store our staff are very good at picking up on that they'll comment on the weather how people are looking what they're wearing um, what they're doing with the rest of their day they do all those things they do it quite naturally it's not not forced in any way they just we seem to attract those types of people so, so you're missing all those social cues and you're engaging that with customers. Yeah, you, you, it's, it's absolutely impossible um, to do that. So how have you gone about thinking about creating those personalized experiences? What are some of the things you've been able to implement to do that online? Well, my team, my, my customer service team, the way we recruited, and this this was probably more luck than than strategy, but I'll take it off with it and I was going to give it to me, is uh, where we're based uh, right in the heart of London. The sorts of people who were looking for work as the world started to stop are people that work in the theatres and the, some of the, you know, the the pubs and clubs. So, so we have um, a, a group of individuals who, uh, who dance and sing and perform because that's what they were trained to do, and they're very natural at it. And then what we've done is we've empowered them with the you know, how to help a customer whose delivery is missing, how to help a customer whose watch is faulty, how to help a customer who wants to buy a car. Yeah. And the, re the the other bit is quite natural to them, whereas. Try, in previous companies, we've we done it the other way around. You, you, you employ people who are 
customer service professionals that remind them, remember to smile, remember to use the customer's name, and, and all that. And it's, with Liberty, it's completely the other way around. Oh, it sounds like a fun company culture. It's, uh, well, we like it that way. I'm really pleased when I hear people say they, uh, they have fun when they come to work. We have serious stuff to do as well, but if we can make it fun, and we try to, then I know I've done my job right. If people go home with a smile on their face, as well as come in with a smile on their face, then I think I'm doing okay. What are some of the technologies that you implemented in order to start serving your customers online? You know, obviously there's putting, as you said, like images online, enabling people to order. Are there other things that you've done, maybe from a customer service perspective? So a couple of big things. So we have a, an online appointment software that, that we, we implemented during lockdown, which helped with... Uh, virtual appointments. So when the store was closed, we still had people working in the store as we were picking web orders, but people could make a virtual appointment for starting sessions for makeup questions, the sorts of things that people will travel to us to do. And we maintain that to a certain extent. We've added WhatsApp to our contact types, which has been hugely popular. Somewhere in the region of 25% of our contacts now comes through WhatsApp. So are customers using that to like troubleshoot issues or asking sort of questions about purchases they're making or just the whole gambit? The whole lot. Initially, it was when we first had it, it was at a busy time for us where our service level back to customers was not where I'd like it to be. So people would use the WhatsApp and it may be a few hours before we get back to them. But um, thankfully, we're in a really good place now. We go, well, we've, uh, we've got the staffing right and the contact level is right and, uh, and things have started to, to smooth out. So, so we're answering queries at the moment. Um, you know, within an hour or so, which means we can start helping with customers who are having trouble checking out, or want a little bit of help making that final decision. You know, is it is this the right product for me? When we can add that personal touch, we can answer questions that possibly aren't there on the web page or are, but aren't you know written in a way that that customer. Sounds. I love the way that you speak about personalization because I think a lot of the time when we talk about this in our industry, we're talking about how can you maybe use a bot to serve the information about a specific product that a specific customer uses. And you're really speaking about it in terms of how can I engage the user or the customer really in making sure that we've got the right product for them and having a very human interaction with all of that. As you see more of these AI and automated technologies coming online, how do you think about maintaining that balance of that very personal human touch with some of these technologies that could potentially increase efficiencies and, and other things like that? The word there is efficiency. It's about the, the ability to, to get, if somebody wants to speak to one of my team, then they should speak to one of my team. And, and that's it. There are many customers who don't. Uh, whereas in, in, in days gone by, they had to because that's the only channel we had, emails and phones. So I think what the technology is, is going to do, and this is what's really exciting, is it helps us understand very quickly, does this customer want to talk to a human or not? And if they mm. do, great. I've got loads of great humans who want to talk to you as well, and they're very good at it. But if you just want an answer, where's my order? Are you open this weekend? Do you take American Express? You know, all that kind of functional stuff. I don't want those customers to have to wait in line behind somebody who wants to chat about a fabric that their grandmother bought from us in the 1930s. Right. All those things are valid, but why should somebody stand in line behind somebody else? So uh, that 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 is what's exciting for me. You know, it's um, something that has come up in several of the conversations I've had recently is really about the impact that AI will have, not just for the customers, but for the people that are helping them. And, you know, just along the lines of what you were just saying, it's all about how can we empower a customer service representative with more information about the user or moving a little bit more quickly or getting some suggested responses so that you can still have that human conversation, but in a more effective, more informed, more efficient way. Nothing makes me smile more in the, when, when I see um, a CSAT comment from a customer that says, oh, what I love about you, Liberty, is you take the time to read my emails and, and somebody gave me a personal response. And then when you look at the response, you can see that that was a macro and it, yeah. and it was two clicks. So if they're, if they're more of a, a warm regards kind of person versus a yours sincerely kind of person, then they're encouraged to do that. Um, we, you know, we, we don't insist that everybody says the uh, Mr. Um, they can say hi again if they choose to. Uh, and and, and we, we trust them to make that judgment call based on the interaction with customers. And they don't always get it right, but you don't always get it right when you talk to them face to face either. It sounds like a lot of this has been really positive for you. What were some of the biggest challenges as you moved to more digital service for your customers? Replicating what goes on in the store um, is not easy. Um, you know, we mentioned right at the top that the um, 
we're, we're coming close to 150 years old and sometimes it feels like some of their processes and some of their systems are equally 150 years old so you know the, the connecting all the dots sometimes can be quite difficult from a technology point of view the customer service team my team are generally are the i would say this clearly unbiased but they're the glue that holds it together so they're the ones that will kind of you know understand what a customer is asking if they're sort of going around the houses and knowing where to go and get that information and translating into an answer that helps the customer so that, that's the biggest challenge is the fact that we have uh, and not all of that parts of our company from a technology point of view talk to each other quite the way you'd want them to. And I'm sure we're not alone in that respect. I'm sure every company has got story with that with respect. One of the things that we've been hearing a lot, particularly in the retail space, is how much customers are looking for really seamless experience. They maybe want to go start looking for products online, have an interaction, a chat bot, but then maybe go to the store to complete the transaction or something like that. How are you thinking about bridging that digital and physical world and trying to make that as seamless an experience as possible? It's, you'd be surprised, actually, for, for a company that only has one shop and one website, how difficult that's been in the past. Fairly recently, we've had a change in management structure, so those two Areas fall under the same director now, always helps. She's got a customer absolutely at the heart of what she does, which is real. The team working together, to be honest with you, Alex, there isn't necessarily a, you can have the best technology in the world, but if, if people don't talk to each other, it's not going to work. So, you know, we, we've got a really strong customer service team based in the store that integrate themselves with this, the store team. So we talk about what's right for customers rather than what's right for a web customer and a store customer. So uh, that's, uh, and that's improves tenfold. What do you think has made the biggest difference? What made that improvement? The people, actually. When we when we first went into that first three weeks is what it was advertised as, wasn't it? And then the three weeks, <laughs> and I think maybe seven months. Many of my colleagues who work in the shop, the shop was closed. They didn't have, effectively, didn't have any jobs, so we had to find something else to do. So they, they came and helped with web picking. Uh, they came and helped with uh, customer service. You know, there were several of the, in fact, my customer service manager used to work in the shop and lock down for an end to that, and she was now part of my team and I'll never give her back. So uh, that experience helped because it, people got to see how the other, how, how things ha operate on the other side and realize that they weren't the enemy. They were just doing things slightly differently with the, you know, the same same set of customers at heart. And that, that's, that for me, that's the best thing that, that could have happened because you can you, you can force those things, can't you? So like, why don't you come and do us a comment with us for two weeks and you'll learn the ropes and we'll come and work with you. For it. And, and I've worked places where we've done that and those things are great, those programs. But this was very much what you're doing this now and you're doing this for the foreseeable future. And in, in many cases, people haven't gone back. They've gone back and they're so much better at what they did before because they understand now. So that's one of the, that's a huge positive for me. Yeah, it sounds like people really had to build some new skill sets, but ultimately things that make us stronger and better at service across the board. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, you know, and, and that's everybody's lying to me. You go, no, no one has said they didn't enjoy it. So uh. we've been seeing retailers experimenting a lot in new territory. Things like fashion shows in Roblox or digital native brands bringing their stuff to physical with pop-up shops. What does all of this kind of innovation and experimentation mean for you? And, and how are you thinking about things that you might be pursuing in the future? Um, I'm not sure we're ready to put the roadblocks to see us and go. I joked with somebody recently that Liberty is a, uh, we're dragging ourselves into the 20th century and they, they corrected me. They thought I meant 21st century and I said, let's go one step at a time. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I mean, we're huge. Well, we like to think we're pretty huge on Instagram. We went past a million followers recently, which is quite a nice uh, quite a nice milestone. Congratulations. Yeah, you know, so so we, uh, we have a, a huge following there. So some of the things we did in lockdown was we engaged with, uh, we have a very big fabrics business. We're very famous for our Liberty Fabrics. So we, so we created the, the Liberty Crafting Club. So there's a there's a whole army of people out there that are you know, making things and quilting and you know, and you know, face masks and scrubs for, the, for for healthcare workers during lockdown. So we engage for the very much with the community spirit in that way. What recommendations would you have for other retailers that are finding that they need to move more into the digital space, or they're trying to figure out how to handle an increasing volume of of customer service requests? What would you tell them? How should they think about it? How should they approach solving that problem? Well, one of the things that um that, that I learned quite early in my customer service journey with Liberty is um coming coming from a uh, coming into what is deemed to be a luxury retailer that sells luxury products. Um, 
you, I, I kept getting told you need to deliver luxury service. That's what customers expect. Um, and then through the um, through the customer satisfaction surveys that we uh, that we send out on the back of our Zendes tickets, we realised quite quickly that customers are really only interested in three things, which is uh, are you uh, were you fast, were you friendly, and were you factual. I've engineered it so they all begin with F. You can probably tell that, but um, yeah, the, the compliments we get that we we answered and we answered really quickly. We did it in a, with a smile on their face, uh, and we answered the question that was being asked of them. And if you boil that down, none of those three things are what you would call luxury. You would expect to get those three things at any service interaction, whether it's a top end or you know towards the bottom. However, what's different with us is if we get any of those three things wrong, we get the phrase which I hate, which is "but I expected more of you because you're liberty." So rather than obsessed, and this is, I guess this is my advice to ask you questions, rather than obsessed with, with what you think people's perception of your brand is, you get the basics right. So you know answer their question or if they ask more than one question ask all of them not just the one that's easy do it in a friendly way and do it as quickly as you can and then the other bit almost doesn't matter because their their, their, their recollection will be well these guys did what they said they were going to do I, I asked for help they gave it and, and it wasn't difficult so take taking away the barriers from the team to make that easy let customers realize they're being listened to which sounds really easy for me to say it, and, it, and it's taken probably five years for me to get it so it's easy said, not too easy to do, but we got it in the end. But it's a good reminder that you don't have to start with the most elaborate, complicated thing. You, what you really need to start with is getting those basics right. Yeah, so yeah, it, it's not it's not a it's not a coincidence that the foundations is the first thing you build and build a house, right? right? Thank you so much for the conversation today. This has been really lovely speaking with you and and learning about this. And I'm sure lots of folks out in the retail industry will be very interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Very very proud to be here, by me. Have a great day. So many industries have undergone a lot of change in the past few years, but retail in particular seems like it's had to really shift dramatically in terms of taking the physical retail experience into a digital space. It sounds like Liberty London has done that very successfully, and it was fascinating hearing from Ian how they've gone about that transformation. On our next episode of Conversations with Zendesk, we'll hear from Michael Pace, VP of Global Member Services at Virgin Pulse. You'll want to tune in for this one. He has some great insights on how they've leveled up their self-service customer support and achieved some huge cost savings while improving the customer satisfaction. He's also going to talk about the employee experience at Virgin Pulse, what makes its culture so great, and why focusing on the employee experience is the key to a great customer experience. So be sure to tune in. Please like and subscribe and share our podcast with a colleague or a friend. You can always find us in the Zendesk community. Visit us at usergroups.zendesk.com for opportunities to connect with other Zendesk users in the customer support and experience space. Until next time, I'm Nicole Saunders for Zendesk, the intelligent heart of customer experience.